Good morning, all. In case you've forgotten about rumination, here is the tie, which I actually remembered to find earlier this week. As always, I have a bunch of thoughts which may or may not be connected. It's up to you. Take those things which you find helpful, and you can sleep, sleep through the rest of them. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. We've already been warned about that. We have changed our color from green to blue and purple. We have lighted the first candle of the Advent wreath. Some of us already have Christmas decorations up in our house. And so the scramble towards finishing the shopping, baking the cookies, wrapping and unwrapping the gifts, going to parties and other concerts and events, and everything else that society tells us we need to do has just begun. We have changed our color from green to blue and purple. Green is the earth. Blue is the sky. Purple is the color of flowers and royalty. Blue reminds us of plants. I'm sorry, green reminds us of plants and the natural world. It tells us that our earthly life is precious, that it is filled with growth and such rich possibilities. Advent blue points us towards heaven. It tells us that we need to take time to ponder not only what surrounds us every day, marvelous as that is, but to recall what we are striving for, what our final goal is. And purple reminds us that things, even if they fade, grow into something even more beautiful. About the Advent wreath and its candles, Richard Leach, an American poet, says, hope is a candle once lit by the prophets, never consumed though it burns through the years, dim in the daylight of power and privilege. When they are gone, hope will shine on. Love is a candle whose light makes a circle, where every face is the face of a friend. Widen the circle by sharing and giving. God's holy dare, love everywhere. Joy is a candle of mystery and laughter, mystery of light that is born in the dark, laughter at hearing the voice of an angel, ever so near, casting out fear. Christ is the light that the prophets awaited. Christ is the lion, the lamb, and the child. Christ is the love and the mystery and laughter. Candles make way. Christ is the day. Yes, today is the first Sunday of Advent. And surprisingly enough, today's scriptures are not talking about the coming of the baby Jesus. Instead, the text we heard call us to focus not so much on the coming feast of the birth of God into history 2,000 years ago, but rather to ponder the future return of Jesus, the so-called second coming of Christ. Almost 900 years ago, St. Bernard of Clairvaux preached a sermon in which he talks about three comings of Christ, in history, in mystery, and in majesty. Those three elements of faith are subtly brought to mind, if we ever bother to think about it, each time we celebrate the Eucharist. Right in the middle of the great Thanksgiving prayer, the pastor says, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving, in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. And we respond, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Encapsulated in that brief refrain, we sum up our faith in 10 words. This truly is a great and mighty wonder. 
God has come to us in history as a child in Bethlehem. Jesus continues to come to us in mystery each time we share the Eucharist and each time we share the love of God with others. And Christ will come again in majesty as the, as the gospel promise us to gather into the Father's house all of the Lord's beloved. A great and mighty wonder indeed. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. I highly recommend Bernard's sermon to you. You might want to read it for yourself sometime. I can probably even find it for you in English. The same approach to this mysterious presence of God, of the one who was, who is, and is to come, is the starting point for this poem by a 20th century poet, Nicholas Graham, whom I believe is a, a Northern Irishman. At the first coming of the Lord, he came to Bethlehem. So softly spoken was the word in this dark world of men that only Mary heard and kept the secret in her breast when down from heaven's high throne he leapt and in her arms found rest. At the next coming of the Lord, he came in bread and wine. His flesh he gave, his blood outpoured, true manna and true vine. And still his promise comes to hold till sacraments shall cease in humble hearts to find a home and they in him their peace. At the last coming of the Lord, in fire and cloud he'll ride. Out of his mouth a two-edged sword to pierce and to divide the hearts and souls of those for whom he died and rose again. Then come, Lord Jesus, quickly come and speak the last amen. And so as we await the celebration of that first coming of God in the flesh, we are called at the same time not only to sing of the Lord's birth, but also to take the teaching of that Lord into our daily living, to share the goodness and the righteousness and the love of God with those we live with every day. Not only that, we also look forward to the day when we shall be at peace and we will feast together with the Almighty and all his faithful ones at the final and everlasting banquet. As the priest poet John Donne wrote so eloquently 500 years ago, bring us, O Lord God, at our last awakening into the house and gate of heaven to enter into that gate and dwell in that house where there shall be no darkness nor dazzling, but one equal light, no noise nor silence, but one equal music. No fears or hopes, but one equal possession. No ends or beginnings, but one equal eternity. In the habitations of thy glory and dominion, world without end. And finally, I would like to share together one of my favorite hymn texts, which unfortunately has become limited to Christmas. Written by Isaac Watts, whose name I bear, in the year 1719, so 300 years ago. You can find it in our hymnal at 246. Watts was a contemporary of the Wesleys. Perhaps his greatest gift to posterity is his versification of the Psalms entitled The Psalms Imitated in the Language of the New Testament. Watts wanted to make the Psalms sing again but not just as sacred words from ancient times, but as ordinary words for everyday people whose understanding of the Bible comes from knowing Jesus the Christ. As we read the text together at 246, we will read a paraphrase of Psalm 98. Note there is not a single reference to Christmas in this text. And in fact, the text could be sung all year long. In some hymnals, for example, the Episcopal Hymnal of 1940, it is located as a communion hymn. In the current Lutheran hymnal, it is listed as an Advent hymn. And in our hymnal, it's a Christmas carol. 
Watts's text also encapsulates those three comings of the Lord, as I hope you will all recognize as we read his words together. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart bear him room, and heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let all their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his cousin. 